So I'm hoping my screen is visible. Um, You're good. Cool. So there's going to be a little bit, this can be quite different from the uh, previous uh, plenary type talk thing. Uh, so this is a hands-on tutorial, uh, and that means I kind of want all 200 or so participants uh, at least given their hand to try and analyze this data. And of course, uh, when you get more people involved in uh, some kind of tutorial, uh, the odds of something going horribly wrong exponentially increases. <laughs> um, so we're going to try to work through that together. Um, you might see me continually look off into the uh, overwhelming nether off to my right hand side. Uh, and I'm basically just looking at the Discord channel. So how I kind of want this to run is that as we go through these hands-on steps, since I can't really directly interact with you guys, um, if there are any issues, pressing questions, things that come up, uh, please put them into ideally the metabolomics uh, text channel on Discord. Uh, so that way I can kind of start um, addressing them if they come up. Of course, I won't be able to get to every little nitty gritty problem that arises, um, but hopefully we can at least start uh, <laughs> working through things together. Um, so before I start, I'll just give a quick introduction to myself. I'm Bob Danzak, I'm a postdoc at PNNL, uh, and I consider myself a microbial ecologist who likes to uh, dabble uh, into um, organic matter a little bit here and there. Um, in order to do so, uh, I had to learn quite a bit about FTICRMS analysis and also to help um, the Wondrous Campaign really use it in some uh, unique ways. Um, so before we start, I'm gonna actually, let me present my screen. So I will be exiting and um, entering presentation mode. Uh, actually, maybe I'll just leave it like this. Uh, hopefully everyone can see it. Yay, nay, I hope. Um, if there are any immediate problems with visual uh, visualization, please let me know. Uh, so the first thing, uh, as I give an introduction, uh, I, everyone should take this time to start downloading some things that they might need or will need if they want to uh, kind of participate along. So firstly, I do have a GitHub um, page for this ICR, ICR tutorial, uh, and it does contain actually a lot of files from previous tutorials that I've given, uh, which unfortunately due to um, GitHub means you have to download everything at one time. So what I'll do is I'll just copy and paste this into the Metabolomics channel. So that way everyone has access to that. Um, next, there is another program that if you want to participate with the first component of this, which is what's uh, a lot of pre-processing that needs to get done, uh, it's called the uh, molecular formula assignment step. Um, you will need another program known as formularity, um, as well as a database to work with formularity. Now I do want to add a caveat since I, I myself am on a Mac. Um, this program only works with uh, Windows PCs. Um, so if you have a Mac or Linux based uh, machine, uh, you're just going to have to unfortunately sit through it um, for now. Uh, hopefully there will be some more developments regarding molecular formula assignment in the future. Uh, so I will also paste these links into the Discord channel so that way everyone has access to them. So on this page, there are two things that you'll need. Um, this is the formularity program and documents. And then there's this database file that you need to download. And you might notice that's quite a large file, which is why I'm kind of having everyone uh, jump on this at this exact moment. Uh, so that way we can uh, get these programs downloaded um, when the actual hands-on component wants to start. Also, I do want to add, cave, cave, uh, add another note if anyone is unfamiliar with GitHub. Um, the way that you will download this, unfortunately, you can't download individual components. Uh, all you have to do is navigate to my this GitHub repository and um, click on code, and then there should be a download as zip option. And you shouldn't need to be logged in or have an account or anything in order to do this. Uh, there might, yeah. Oh, yeah, and also, sorry, just to, a note to those folks who are asking about the Lambda R script, uh, it is available underneath this ICR tutorial um, GitHub repository. Uh, it's uh, labeled as carbon efficiency dot R. Uh, now I do want to add a note that this particular version of the script was kind of handcrafted for the tutorial. So there might be some uh, bumps <laughs> along the way. Um, okay, cool. Uh, when looking at it, but if you guys need help, feel free to email me, contact me, whatever you need, and I can help you walk through that stuff. 
So sweet. Um, so first off, let's go and give an org uh, overview of what this tutorial is going to look like. Uh, so first, I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse at what the FTIC RMS is and what it does, uh, how Wonders plays in uses the FTIC RMS, and how we can start accessing the data that Wonders has, you know, provided uh, to the Great Air community. Uh, then beyond there, we're going to walk through some many, uh, some of the more common uh, data analysis pipelines. Uh, so we're going to look at how we can pre-process the data using um, uh, a uh, R package developed by many folks at EMSL, and it's a super great package, but we're going to use that. Uh, we're going to look at how to uh, generate those van prevalent plots that James briefly mentioned, so that way we can look at uh, what I like to term the molecular, molecular formula landscape across samples and across data sets. Uh, and we're going to start comparing some of the molecular properties, uh, so things like the uh, Gibbs free energy or NOSC values that uh, VGC mentioned across samples and again across data sets. Uh, we will then be going into some more uh, higher level analyses in principle. We won't actually be doing this hands on, but I do have scripts available for you to use these kinds of techniques. Um, so we'll look at common multivariate analyses like PCAs and NMDSs. Uh, the transformation analysis, and I'll briefly introduce the uh, lambda theory that Hyun uh, we'll discuss in much greater detail this afternoon. Uh, I do want to add a note uh, that I forgot to mention. On the GitHub page, uh, when you go to the EMSL Summer School 2020, there's actually both this presentation that I'm currently giving uh, available, and then also the uh, this text document, the docx file here. Um, this actually gives a step-by-step uh, -step walkthrough instruction of what uh, each, how, how to run each step. So if you get lost or get hit, hung up on any component, uh, you can refer to that walkthrough kind of to get you back on track. Or if you have to leave for whatever reason, it's a long tutorial, uh, this will also help you get back on track. So cool. So first up, uh, as you heard, uh, FTI CRMS stands for Fourier Transform Ion Cyclotron Resonance Mass Spectrometry, uh, which is exactly why we abbreviated FTI CRMS because that is a mouthful. Uh, and it is capable of detecting many different carbon compounds due to its incredibly high uh, mass resolution uh, and accuracy. Um, there is a link within the PowerPoint um, that takes you to a, uh, a low level, but great overview of how FTI CRMS actually, be, how the instrument actually collects data. Um, and you can access that at the MAG lab. Um, in principle, all it does is measure the, um, it ionizes some sample using many different ionization techniques. Um, and uh, those ions enter into a cell. Uh, we can then measure the mass of these ions. Um, and then using these masses that we get out of it, uh, we can assign molecular formulas using previously compiled databases. Uh, today, we're not gonna be focusing on how to take data that's directly from the instrument and actually processing it. We're gonna have uh, data that's already undergone one level of pre-processing. Um, we're going to cover how to download some of this data from existing sources, how to get it into a more usable format, and then how we can, how we can start generating figures using this data. Um, the reason we aren't covering the actual uh, machine to processed data pipeline uh, is because there's a lot of considerations that need to be made when um, doing that initial pre-processing step. Uh, and it, it requires a little bit of nuance that we don't unfortunately have enough time or uh, unfortunately due to some uh, resource restrictions, the resources to actually carry on, um, carry out rather. Uh, so how does Wonders really kind of mesh with this FTI CRMS data? Well, Wonders, as you've heard yesterday and I think earlier today, uh, stands for the Worldwide Hydrobiogeochemistry Observation Network for Dynamic River Systems. Again, wonders. Uh, and uh, we collect samples from uh, many hydrologically dynamic rivers throughout the world using distributed sample, uh, sampling um, and uh, very close relationships with many, many collaborators. Uh, so as part of wonders, we collect copious amounts of different data. Uh, but one of the key things that we do collect uh, is FTI. Well, I don't want to say one of the key things. That's unfair to the other data types. One of the things that I'm interested in uh, is FTI CRMS data. Uh, that we collect for each sample. Uh, this data, once we have it uh, run through that initial pre-processing step that requires some consideration um, and proprietary software, uh, we upload to a public repository, ESS Dive, for public use. Um, as 
part of Wonders, we do take the onus to make sure that that data is Q QA'd and QC'd, uh, and that the data makes as much um, sense <laughs> uh, as we can. So that way, all the research, any researcher across the world can take this data, uh, analyze it, and answer questions that interest them. Uh, now, I do want to stress when I say the data makes sense, it's just to make sure there isn't any outstanding outlier or problem due to data collection. We don't really do any kind of like analysis to ensure we're steering <laughs> analysis in any specific way. Uh, so the first good starting point, um, so that way anyone who's watching right now can actually kind of jump in and start analyzing any data that they, that they may have seen that's really interesting to them, is how do we actually access data from uh, ESS Dive? Uh, so it is all available on the data archive, um, on the DOE's data archive, which is called ESS Dive, uh, which I will also post into, oops, sorry. Apparently he decided to copy as an image. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> copy. Hmm. Unfortunately, I will have to do a shortcut. I oh, have... I'll put it, Bob, I'll put it in there. All right, yeah, oh, okay. I, was, I already actually had it open in another place too. <laughs> Pre-planned. Um, yeah, so to walk through it in a PowerPoint format and then I'll actually walk through it in the, uh, how I would find it because I can never remember the ESS Dive format. Um, first thing that you need to do is navigate to this actually ESS Dive repository and then when you see it under the search phrase, simply type Wonders. When you type Wonders in there, you will see uh, many different entries appear, and each of the entries that you do encounter are things that uh, the Wonders team has uploaded. Um, and when you click on it, you will see something that looks something like this with the authors, the name of the data set, uh, a DOI, so it's actually very citable, and we encourage you to actually cite it if you do use this data. Um, but more importantly, uh, you do see the uh, two um, metadata file and then the actual um, data package, we talk, call it. And this contains all of the FTICR data, geochemical data, uh, and anything in between hydrogeological data. Um, on this page, you'll see a download link. In order to actually download data, you do have to have an ORC ID, uh, ORCID, however it's actually pronounced. Um, but when you do have that and you are logged in, uh, you can then simply just click download and it will download, um, you can either just click, uh, sorry, uh, click download here or download up here um, to either download all the files or just the data package. Uh, when you download it, it will look something like this where we have Wonders 48 hour sample site. Um, if it, well, I should say Wonders, if it is the 48 hour sampling campaign, um, 48 hour and then the sampling site. Uh, FTICR, geochemistry, metadata, MPOC, provisional hydrograph, reading site photos. Uh, naturally, since we are in a FTICR focused um, you know, tutorial, uh, the key um, data of interest is contained within the FTICR folder. Uh, and when you click on that folder, uh, you will see a number of different files in there. Before I move on, actually, I want to show how it actually works. Um, you'll see a number of different files in there that are labeled XML. So to kind of show this manually, how I always have to find ESS Dive because I can never remember the website, is if you simply just type in ESS Dive to Google, go to it, you'll see a data portal up in the right-hand corner. Uh, when you click on that data portal, it will take you to the ESS Dive website, uh, data archive website, I should say. Uh, from there, uh, under search phrase, all you need to do is type in wonders, enter, and then it will pop up with all of the data sets that uh, we have collected. Um, and I think this already should have filtered it to the wonders data that we have. Yeah, it has. Uh, so anywhere on the map is things that we can see we have wonders data that are provided. Um, but then we can also just click on the wonders data itself to take us to um, one of the rivers, in this case, it's the Altamaha River in Georgia. Um, you can see it has how many citations it has, so you can find out what papers it was cited in, how many times it's been downloaded, how many times it's been viewed. Uh, you can either, in this case, for some reason, uh, download all is not highlighted, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, from there, you can see uh, the download button. Wait, where is actually? Hmm, something must have went. 
Oh, it's because I'm the author. That's not, let's not worry about that one right now. That's why things looked a little bit different. Um, yeah, so let's go to this one just for demonstration purposes. Uh, then you can see something here we can actually click and download it. Uh, so regarding uh, Britt Abramson's question in Discord, you need to download the ESS dive data for the tutorial, no. So I actually do have demonstration data already uh, provided for us within the uh, GitHub repository um, because it's actually data that you will be looking at later in the day. Um, so I took the uh, liberty to kind of parse some of that data out for you guys already. Um, kind of just showing you how you would actually download some of this. So once you're here, then you would just click on download. Don't want to download it at the moment because that's a bit, a bit of a big file. Um, but once you get that zip file, uh, you will be able to see all of those uh, different folders and file structures. And you're free to use those in uh, whatever with, with, with correct citations in whatever way uh, you find um, most interesting. Um, so are there any questions about actually ESS Dive at this moment before we kind of jump into the first hands-on component? If not, I'll just kind of roll along. I'm not seeing anything um, in Discord or the chat as far as I can tell. So I think you're okay for now. Sweet, 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 sweet. Is there a way to bulk download? Uh, are you referring to download from all of the Wonders data? Uh, so like every single uh, thing that Wonders has ever uh, processed. Uh, I don't believe there's a way to download everything immediately, um, but you can, uh, there's I think, yeah, nine data sets that are currently uploaded. Uh, fortunately that's uh, not too hard, <laughs> um, but no, there's not a way that I'm aware of to actually download all of these data sets at the moment. There might be a API or something in the back end that you can actually access, I'm just not aware of it. Um, yeah. Can I still follow the tutorial without the formulary part? So yes, uh, Kadir, uh, you will be able to follow the tutorial after immediately following the formulary part because as part of the uh, GitHub repository, actually I'll kind of take you there to orient you to that. Um, so within the GitHub repository, there is a folder called XML files, which will be necessary for the um, formulary part, but I have taken, again, the liberty to pre-generate that report that uh, will be created from those XML files for anyone who is on Linux um, or Mac OS uh, to kind of follow along uh, once that formulary component is done. Um, uh, so the uh, key reason that we do want uh, to kind of give some uh, uh, tutorialization information about how to use formulary uh, is because um, when you download the data from ESS Dive, it is going to be in this XML file format. And um, we want to make sure that folks have some ability to at least, uh, even if they can't do it today, they understand how to analyze it in the future. Uh, I do want to add, add a, uh, I want to add another note um, that there is a, another, there, are currently other ways in development to do this step. They're just not currently ready. <laughs> um, and there is, I don't want to like tip a hat or anything, but there's ruminations of trying to implement this type of step in things like KBase to make it more broadly accessible, to make it more um, usable. Um, now again, there's no official movement on that regard, but there are, um, we're trying to make this step as more as amenable as possible, um, as broadly accessible as possible, I should say. So cool. So as I mentioned, when you download stuff from ESS Dive, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a big file. That's kind of why I was hoping to stall for as long as possible. Um, yeah, so when you download the data, either from the GitHub, pack, uh, the GitHub repository uh, or from an ESS Dive um, data package, uh, it will be in these XML files. So these XML files are what we call peak picked. Um, so as uh, VGC mentioned in her talk, the data that comes off the instrument after some initial, there's actually 
some initial pre-processing that goes into it before that, uh, exist as a mass spectra with intensities on the y-axis and m over z values on the uh, x-axis. Um, we uh, could go through and manually pick what we think are good peaks, um, but that becomes problematic when you have thousands upon thousands of <laughs> peaks to go through in hundreds upon hundreds of different data points. Uh, so there are proprietary programs that exist uh, that will um, use an algorithm to kind of identify uh, the noise, uh, basically identify what's a real peak from the background noise. So we do take um, that step, uh, we, we perform that step first. Uh, just to make sure that folks don't need to have access to some proprietary software or do something that's a little bit uh, unusual. Um, so before I answer a question, I do want to just add what formulary is actually doing and then I can kind of pause for a second. Um, so for the data that is in ESS dive to actually be useful, it does need some initial processing using a program uh, called formulary, which was designed by uh, an excellent researcher at Emsel, known as uh, Nikola Tolik, uh, as, as well as many other um, folks. Um, but this program is quite versatile, and it will allow us to uh, calibrate peaks, assign molecular formula, uh, align data, and allow us to analyze all of this data kind of together. So what do I mean by calibrate and alignment and things like that? Uh, so the data that comes off the instrument, while pretty reliable, we kind of need to give it uh, at least under the current um, envisioning of FTICR data analysis. Um, we need to give it a uh, point of view. Uh, so we need to make sure that all the data that we're analyzing to together is uh, analyzed under this uh, common framework, basically. We need to ha ensure that similar peaks are identified within each of these data sets and that we adjust the masses to ensure that they're directly comparable to each other. Uh, alignment is then a step which is uh, questionable. It's necessary at the moment, uh, but it's it's a complicated step. Uh, we basically take a moving average of all of the masses and start combining uh, masses, combining entries, detected peaks, uh, below some common threshold. Um, there's nuance to it, uh, but that's ostensibly what it is doing. Uh, using these then finally derived masses, uh, we can then um, assign molecular formulas according to that database file that you are downloading. So this is where I do want to add an important caveat about FT FTMS uh, derived data. Um, this data only provides molecular formula. It does not provide compounds, it does not provide, you know, we will use the term metabolite, but even then we, it technically doesn't provide a metabolite as we have no structural information about these uh, molecular formula at all. We can infer structural information using the, um, you know, some properties of the formula, but it is still inherently a molecular formula. Um, and so uh, the language that you use around it needs to be tempered as such. Another important caveat, uh, as was alluded to before, is that um, this data is not quantitative. So when you look and first analyze this uh, data using formularity, you will see many intensities for each of the uh, different molecular formula. And it might be very tempting to use these intensities as a sort of abundance measurement. Um, there might be some very limited cases where that's fair, but I would say for the general, especially for environmental data and for most general analyses, um, it is prudent to convert those intensities to simply presence absence. Um, and so those are the two main caveats I want to add with FDI CRMS data when using it. Um, it they're downsides, but it is there are many uh, you know commiserate upsides to FDI CRMS data that you know so trade offs basically exist. Um, ostensibly, what formularity will do um, is then from these XML files generate uh, a uh, report that's called. Uh, and this report will contain all of the molecular formulas, uh, present, presence, absence data, uh, as well as some other uh, miscellaneous information. Uh, so if you wanted quantitative information, what types of measurements would you have to do? 
Well, that's the question is, what are you trying to measure? Uh, that really dep depends on your research question. So one of the benefits with FTI CRMS data is it's incredibly untargeted. Uh, so we can get access to many uh, molecular formula. Whereas there are many quantitative measurements um, that have trade-offs. You have to have some question in mind, something to target basically uh, that you need to investigate. And as uh, James is mentioning, uh, Will Q will go into detail, uh, some detail about uh, what other instruments can be paired with FTICR to get a more complete DOM picture. Um, because Linux cannot use formularity, is it in KBase or other FT uh, or other FTMS analysis? Um, so unfortunately, at this current moment, I don't want to stress, this might change shortly, and I don't want to, like again, give any firm numbers on anything. Um, unfortunately, at this current moment, we cannot uh, do this step when it's not on a Windows PC. Um, there are other programs that do exist uh, that do similar things to formularity um, currently uh, that do exist. I think there's one that is in Python. Um, but since we, this is giving the pipeline that Wonders uses, uh, the standardized pipeline that we've used throughout the Wonders process. Um, and we don't want to kind of introduce some more variables to that process as we can go by. There is, as I mentioned, I don't want to say firmly because there's nothing firm currently, uh, but there are efforts to introduce formularity into KBase uh, and trying to get this entire pipeline in a more uh, streamlined fashion that you don't need to kind of have as many different um, programs. Uh, we aren't there yet. Uh, but we are working toward that. Uh, so uh, I, I know that doesn't directly <laughs> answer the question, um, but uh, unfortunately, if you're on Linux or Mac OS, and again, I am on Mac, uh, so I always have to have some access to a Windows PC uh, when I need to do this analysis. Um, I unfortunately, can't participate in this first step. Now, I want to mention there are many other steps that you all will have the full capability of participating in, regardless of your operating system. Um, will be interesting because, no, it should work on Linux. I did actually have someone test it on Linux. Uh, so yeah, every step should work regardless of operating system, uh, as long as you have R installed. Uh, hopefully that was enough stalling to get at least most folks <laughs> with uh, um, formularity downloaded, maybe a database. Uh, hopefully. It's a big file. Yeah, I know. It's unfortunate. Um, let's see. Well, what I can do is kind of give an overview on, yes, and, and uh, James is mentioning within the Discord chat that there is, uh, there is interest in trying to broaden accessibility to things like formularity. Um, and so we're hopefully getting there. Uh, so how often is this database updated Will we need to constantly reinstall it, Bram asks. Uh, as you can see from the number on that database, it should, uh, it should actually still be on that actual file. I want to make sure I'm not speaking. Yeah, so that was updated in 2016. Yeah, I don't expect it to be updated anytime soon. Um, uh, so this is a database that was compiled by folks at the Woods Hole Institute, Oceanographic Institute, um, a while ago, and it's kind of like the de facto uh, formula assignment database at the moment. Now I want to stress there are, um, cut off the presses, there are currently new pipelines that don't require this database in development. Um, and I can't speak any more to that, but there are new ways to start assigning formulas currently in development that uh, eliminate a lot of the restrictions caused by this particular pipeline. Minimize that. Uh, so what I'll do, um, twofold. I'll do the same thing that I did with ESS Dive. I'll walk through what formularity is and how kind of orient you to how to use the formularity program, and then I'll actually give a more me running formularity. Um, so that way we can uh, see all. Um, 
aspects of it. And more importantly, to hopefully delay long enough for folks to actually get formularity installed. Um, I, would do, I do wanna add an important thing that I didn't actually directly mention. If you do use formularity for anything, especially if you are taking Wonders data and downloading it, do be sure that you are uh, citing Nikola, Nikola's paper, um, just to make sure that the credit is given to where it needs to go. Um, so yeah, so as I said like 800 times, unfortunately, formularity does require Windows at this juncture. Uh, so those running Mac OS, Linux cannot participate at this moment. The rest of the tutorial, fair game. This exact moment, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, so the first two things that when, uh, for, the reason formularity is so useful is that it's actually a very user-friendly program. So when you first open up formularity, you will get a window that looks a little bit more blank than this. Um, but uh, it's very drag and drop based. So you don't have to do too much like finicky with like command line or anything like that. It's a very well-designed GUI. Um, so the first thing that you wanna do is under the, yep, sorry. Under the, uh, uh, GitHub repository, the uh, Emmer Summer, uh, Emsel Summer School 2020 folder under on the GitHub repository, uh, you will see a file that's named Nig Calibrance uh, PIP NT with HMC dot uh, ref. Uh, this dot ref file is the uh, calibration list that formularity uses to kind of start putting um, all of these different uh, samples onto the same context. Uh, sorry, double checking some things. I saw that there's some action in the other channels and I wanted to make sure they weren't questions. Um, so yeah, and if you, I don't know if it will work. Yeah, so if you actually open up the calibration list, uh, it's pretty neat. It has some information of where it came from, but more importantly, it's actually a very simple thing uh, where you see a molecular formula and then it's given uh, mass and whatever Z value. Um, and that's ostensibly all that we're doing is we're trying to find masses that match this specific molecular formula in our data set to put all of these data in the same framework. Again, framework in air quotes, it's, not, it's a little bit more complex than that, but um, from there, all you have to do is drag and drop that calibration list under, under the uh, location that says drop calibration file. Pretty nice. Uh, next, then this step will take a moment. Uh, that Woods Hole Molecular Formula database that you downloaded, hopefully, or might not be, maybe downloaded. Um, <laughs> there's another place that says drop database file. Simply drag and drop that molecular formula database into that drop database file location, and it will load. Important note, there are a lot of steps within formularity that when you drag and drop something into it, might seem like it's just not doing anything and it seems like your computer is completely frozen. Uh, it's not. <laughs> um, it, it, trust me, it, it's going, it's working. Uh, it will um, work. Hmm. That's an interesting error. I've never run into that error. Uh, so Alejandra is mentioning that um, they cannot drop anything into formularity. Uh, I'm not sure. We will... Hmm. Um, I might have a suggestion. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually the drop um, portion gets habilitated after all of the other conditions get fixed. So making sure you have um, all the check buttons, all the other parameters uh, fixed with what Bob is showing on the screen and then you should be able to drop. Uh, at least that's what has happened to me. Okay, that's weird. Normally, oh, well, well um, so we will, uh, be going over, um, exactly what you need to check and not check. Usually I was able to drop those first. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's because I've used it so long that my stuff is already set up to be default. Um, so we will make sure that works. Uh, there is a step where I will go, um, through what you need to check. Huh. That's interesting. I didn't know you had to have anything checked for that. That's actually surprising to me. Um, yeah, that's why we have uh, folks that are helping out. 
Um, so yeah, when you have those dragged and dropped, again, the, the form molecular formula database will take a moment to run uh, and it will seem like nothing's happening, but it is. Um, from there, there are a couple settings that you do need to tweak, and I do have these listed out within the uh, walkthrough. Um, oh, okay, so you do need to change the linear first. Okay, that's a good note. So um, I guess it comes default as none, maybe. I thought it was defaulted as auto. Uh, under this regression mar uh, uh, drop down menu here, uh, you need to change that to linear first. So there are other uh, regression me um, methods that you can use. Uh, we use linear due to convention. Um, so the first thing you need to do, apparently, again, this is uh, for a very long time. Am I still on? Okay, good. Sorry, my uh, VPN freaked out for a moment. Um, yeah, so you just need to take this uh, drop down menu and switch it to linear. That's a good, that's a very good point. Thank you. That's pretty awesome. Um, so from there, once you have those files loaded, so you won't be able to do, I know that you won't be able to do this step until the uh, database is actually loaded. Uh, you want to make sure that CIA up in the top is checked. This stands for the compound identification algorithm. This is actually the uh, st currently the standardized algorithm that uh, follows a couple important rules in identifying whether or not a mass matches uh, a mass within the database. Under calibration, uh, so this box here, there's a calibration section. Uh, you wanna make sure the start tolerance is set to five, uh, regression is linear, and end tolerance is uh, set to 0 0.5. Um, these should, and now again, apparently I might be wrong, but because <laughs> I've used it for too long that I don't remember what it was like the first time I used it. Um, these should be the defaults. Um, but just make sure if they aren't, make sure they are set to that. Um, next, under this CIA formula finding step, uh, you wanna make sure that here, uh, there is a, a checkbox that says alignment. Okay, good. So yes, confirm, some confirmation that five and 0.5 are the defaults. Uh, next, under alignment, uh, you want to make sure that this is checked. And then under alignment tolerance, we set this to 0.5. So this is the step that is merging uh, different peaks. Yeah, so you won't be able to check CIA uh, until the database is loaded. You have to ensure that the database is first loaded or else CIA will not be available to be checked. Um, because as part of CIA, uh, the, the, the actual identification algorithm, you do need to have a database for it to reference back to. So hopefully that fixed it. Again, it will take a second for that database to load. It takes a hot second. Um, from there, uh, there is one more thing that you should need to change. Everything else, the formula tolerance should be 0.5, should be default. DB mass limit is 500, should be default. Um, use relationship should be checked. If, it, if use relationship is not checked, make sure it is checked. Um, and then under the relation, uh, max relationship gaps, make sure that's set to two. Um, when you have downloaded formularity, so uh, it should have downloaded an entire folder, there is actually a document that comes along with it. Um, you can open that document to uh, see what each of these tweaks that we're doing really changes. Each of these changes one specific behavior of our compound identification algorithm or other components of formularity, um, and they can have uh, wildly profound impacts on the formulas that uh, you get at the end. Something as simple as having the start tolerance set to six instead of five can change the outputs that you get at the end. So it is important that if you're trying to analyze things in a, more, in a very standardized manner, uh, that you um, uh, keep everything consistent across all your data sets or within wonders or things like that. Um, and more importantly, when you do publish, uh, try to be as complete as possible uh, to ensure that people can re uh, replicate exactly what you're doing. Uh, the last step, um, if it's not, and I will answer your question one second, um, the last thing on this uh, 
step that you want to make sure you do under uh, everything else that we just discussed. There's a box that says you use formula filters. Again, pretty sure that's checked by default, but do make sure it is checked. Um, and then under user defined filter, uh, you do have to put in a whole mess of nonsense there. Um, so this is kind of controlling the limitations on what molecular formula can and cannot be assigned. Uh, and again, this is due to some underlying limitations of FTICR that we have to take into consideration when assigning molecular formula, um, at least currently. Um, yes, so what I was about to say, since this is a mess of stuff, uh, under the Word document, all, all of these things are mentioned. Um, so when you downloaded the GitHub repository, eh, why do I keep going there? Have it. That's why. So under the GitHub repository, uh, where it has something like this, but on your computer, uh, the calibration list, yeah, uh, is under this one right here. So neg calibrants pip nt with hmc dot ref. So that is your calibration file. The uh, list of settings can be found either by looking at the image under the PowerPoint. Uh, so that image is in that PowerPoint file. Uh, or you can open up the Word document. Which looks like that. Um, oh, and there is one step I forgot to mention. Oop, OK, I'll mention that, though. Um, so this will list all the settings that should apparently not be default, um, but uh, more things were default were not default than I thought they were, but such as such as like. Um, but yeah, this walkthrough will list the settings. Particularly, the one that's the most annoying is the user defined filter, which you can then copy and paste over. Uh, regarding not checking the CIA, that is interesting. So just to make sure, you do have the Woods Hole um, database. Uh, well, in your case, it would just be the db.bin file. It doesn't have the GUI part on it. Um, you do have that loaded, and you do have everything else down here as well as Matt use relationships checked. Uh, and then also, okay, settings that might not be default, just make sure they are default. Uh, make sure charge is set to one, adduct is left blank, and then ionization is set to proton detachment. I don't want to go into details about exactly what those mean because they are fine. Um, uh, there are some fine details, but the document that does come with formularity does outline what each of these behaviors do. So for instance, the ionization step, you would need to change depending on how you collected your data on the instrument. Since all this data is coming directly from Wonders, we collected all the data in a very standardized way, so we know this upper part doesn't need to change. Uh, so loading the database, uh, currently, just due to Ease. Uh, the database is accessible off of the formularity website that I provided briefly in the beginning. Um, yes. Uh, as Will Q said, there is a database included in one of formularity's public, public releases. Um, it's a bit of a big file. Um, but all you have to do is drag and drop that database into, oh, oh no. Oh, well, I can get back to that. Um, drag and drop that database back into the uh, gray box that says load database file here. As well as saying, it can take up to 30 seconds, it can take 30 seconds up to several minutes to import, uh, and it will seem like nothing is happening. I want to stress. <laughs> it will seem like formularity is completely frozen, nothing's happening, and the folder from which you dragged the uh, um, the database file also will be fairly inactive. Uh, I can say with like full confidence, something is happening. <laughs> it, ju it just doesn't seem that way. <laughs> but so with this in mind, uh, there's one other step uh, before I promise I will then actually walk through how I, I will actually show you me doing it. Um, so that way we can actually see together uh, all the steps that I do, and then you can kind of align. Because um, this is right now more of a theoretical overview of how formularity works. Yes, the, sh the, the box for adduct should be empty, and the result, uh, the re the result box should be m-p. Yes. So once you have all that stuff set up, 
you should have a nice alluring uh, drop spectra files green box in the upper right hand corner. Um, from there, you will be able to take those XML files that are on the GitHub repository, which of course I closed. Uh, can shift T, control shift T. Of course, nothing's working. Okay. Okay, keyboard's dead. Fine by me. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes. So under oop, under the Emsel Summer School 2020, uh, the XML files. You can then drag and drop those to that nice alluring green box, tantalizing green box. Again, <laughs> it will seem like nothing is happening. <laughs> there is a, 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 an eerie calm. Uh, amongst the data. Um, but that's just because it does take a second for formulary to really load that stuff into memory and actually run through the formula assignment steps. Now, is my keyboard? That's really irritating. 50-50, this keyboard just sometimes shuts off. Okay, so now what I will do is actually walk through um, how I run formularity very quickly. Um, hopefully getting everyone caught up to the last step here. So hopefully folks can see the screen when I'm doing this. So as I said, I do always have to have access to a Windows PC, which means I always remote into a Windows PC. Uh, ooh, that's unexpected. Um, so I'm just gonna minimize this stuff, don't worry about it. I'm not close to anything. Um, So open formularity and bam. So you can see mine's already kind of set up default, um, but that's because what, the nice thing about formularity is once you set these settings once, every time you open up formularity, they will be maintained default. You'll notice that I've been playing around with another setting here, so I'll just change that back to five. Um, I cannot see Discord. Uh, can folks see the Windows screen? Preferably James or someone speak up if yep. you can see your PGC. Yep, I can see it. Cool. Um, so, okay, as I said, uh, you can see it looks pretty, it, mine's already set up to where the start tolerance is five, end tolerance is 0.5, uh, charge is one, add ox blank, results M-P, ionization is proton detachment, um, max relationship caps two, use relationships, all that wonderful stuff we covered, it's already checked. Uh, and then I do have the user defined filter already in place. Um, and again, I wanna, add the significant point that tweaking any component of this can have quite profound impacts on the eventual report. This is what I would consider the standard Wonders settings for any data that you collect from Wonders. Um, you need to make sure it looks like this. There is something here that does, uh, I didn't cover under peak filters. Uh, the minimum S slash N, which I have to seven, but I think defaults to three or something. Um, this you don't technically need to worry about as much because the data that we've already filtered is, that we've published is already uh, filtered to a signal noise of seven. Um, but if you want to feel better, uh, you can change that to seven. Um, so from there, just quickly rewarranting myself. Bob, you have a question in the chat. Should they just drop one of the XML files? Uh, well, spectra. you can drop at least two. Uh, if you drop one, uh, so for formularity behaves quite different if you use only one file at a time um, than if you do uh, multiple files at a time. Um, so I would at least do two as just demonstration purposes to make sure everything, everything is running correctly. Um, but uh, so just to show you what I have, I have a common location for my stuff. So I drag and drop my calibration file, loaded. You can see it says Nate Calibrance, and then drag and drop the database file to where it says drop DB files. And then as I mentioned, for anyone who might still be loading it right now and might be having some trouble with the CIA, can't click it or anything, you can see Formularity is doing a whole lot of nothing. Uh, this folder doing a whole lot of nothing. Um, just kind of got to patiently wait until Formularity well, finishes loading. Bob, are you gonna 
uh, tell us again where to get the uh, user defined filter. Uh, yes, yeah. so you can find that under, uh, if you, can you still see my screen? Yep. Cool. I will copy and paste it into Discord. That'll be easier. Copy. Paste. What is going on here? I'm being punked. <laughs> Every time I copy something from a, uh, 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 a Windows product, a Microsoft product, it seems to want to consider it an image. So there must be some weird text processing on Discord that I don't understand. <laughs> There you go. That should be the uh, user defined filter. But it is also under the walkthrough document that would have been downloaded with the GitHub repository. And so if we go back to my computer, haha, <laughs> yeah. So you can see um, the only way the CIA will be able to be checked is if you see the terms loaded formularity db.bin. If you do not see loaded formularity db.bin, you're not going to be able to check uh, the CIA box um, because you do need to have a database file loaded. Also, you probably, no, okay, never mind. That was me testing. Um, so once you do have that database file loaded, all you, and all you have to do is drag and drop it over into the load db files box. Uh, once you have that loaded, Click CIA, uh, you'll see a nice little alluring green box up here. Okay. Now you won't. <laughs> Bob, I think I made a mistake because I dropped the DB file into the IPA formula finding location where it said to drop database, but I was supposed to just drop it in the main window. Oh. DB files. Is that right? Uh, that won't cause a problem or anything. Uh, so IPA is another way of assigning formulas. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, um, advanced. Uh, it requires a little bit more nuance in order to assign formulas that way. Um, as long as you simply drag and drop it under the CIA formula finding step um, and then make sure CIA is checked and not IPA, you shouldn't have any problems. Okay. Now again, I've never done that, but it, the formulary is designed to have those kind of uh, segmented from each other. All right, so that I was having the same problem with CIA not checkable, and it, then when I loaded, just now I dropped it into that CIA formula finding, and now it's available. So if anybody else is having that problem, they may have done the same mistake I did. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. So under the CIA formula finding, you need to make sure the database is loaded. Not under any other formula finding, but CIA. Uh, that is the current, as I said, defaults. Not the best, just the default assignment protocol. Um, yes. Bob, you have another question about the calibration sure. reference. Um, uh, is, it, um, is it one calibration reference file for any sample or does it depend on the targets? Ooh, yeah. So um, that's a very good question. Um, so currently Wonders uses a default uh, calibration reference that is uh, that was provided by Nikola. It's, it's, it's a broad target uh, calibration list. Um, but if you want to improve calibrations uh, and make sure they are uh, geared toward your system, it would be prudent to design your own calibration lists. Now it's not like super easy to make sure you have a good calibration list, uh, but it would be prudent. That is something that uh, currently within Wonders uh, what we've noticed is that there is some difference in calibration and how good calibrations are purely based upon whether or not samples were derived from uh, water or sediment. Um, and again, that's just that the only variation between them. It's the same site, but if we have water versus sediment, calibrations change their capability. Now, second note, there's a lot of difference between water and sediment. That could also be messing with the calibrations as well. Complex mix mixtures are complex. And when you go to sediment or even soil or things, things get even more complex than water. Um, but it might be, in our case, we are trying to develop a, um, a new calibration list that might be able to somehow uh, control 
for the differences that exist between the sediment and surface water. Might not improve results at all, but at least the calibrations are better. Um, so yes, uh, it, there is a question of targets, but the one that I've provided is a fairly broad range general negative calibration, uh, calibration list for samples collected using ESI negative ionization. Cool. Uh, now I'm just trying to find where I put this data. Cool. And I found it. <laughs> so yeah, once you have everything set up and there's a nice green drop spectra box here and CIA is checked, if IPA is checked, I quite frankly don't know how it's going to behave. Um, I'm just going to do five or six or so. Um, simply highlight the XML files that you want to analyze, drag them over to the drop spectra files and let go. It will turn red. And again, it will seem like nothing's happening other than that red box, the green box becoming red. But uh, if you wait patiently, uh, you will see that it will change from drop spectra files eventually to uh, a file name. Unfortunately, we'll just list the first file name. Um, but more importantly, within the folder that the, the, the folder that contains the XML files, uh, you will now have two new files uh, known as report and then report uh, date time log. So the report contains all of the molecular file, uh, molecular formula information, uh, the intensity information, the combined samples, and then the log uh, actually contains the calibration information. Uh, today, that's not super um, important. But I do want to add the note, uh, anytime you download uh, Wonders data, we do have scripts that take uh, into account um, whether or not samples calibrate good or not. And so you should run those. We do provide those scripts and things like that. So they're readily available to you. Um, but you should download those scripts. And if you are analyzing Wonders data, remove badly calibrating samples um, to ensure that things don't go wrong. Uh, and it's because uh, whenever a sample calibrates badly, what basically happens is its mass is always offset from all the other masses. It's basically, it's again, the whole point of calibration is to ensure everything is under the same framework. Again, air quotes framework. Um, and if you have samples that aren't in that same framework, they're going to appear wildly different. Uh, and they do. Uh, under multivariate analyses or things like that, they always appear almost 100% uh, different from samples that do calibrate well. Um, so we do have ways of identifying them, uh, them and controlling for them, though. Um, hopefully, folks, I'm going to move back to my screen here. Um, yes. Will is adding very good, important information here. <laughs> um, so is there any consensus on to whether or not folks have had any luck uh, running formularity? Because we're into an hour. Uh, and I would actually like to move on to the next step at some point to make sure folks can um, at least understand how to use this information. Ah. So if you have a report log, but no, it, sorry, if you have a log, but no report CSV, that is um, formularity's way of kind of telling you something went wrong. Um, it, unfortunately, it might be hard to find out what wrong. Chances are it was a calibration error, which shouldn't happen with this data. I might be mistaken. I'm gonna double check. Maybe that's why I had my tolerances so higher. Possible. So while that's right, um, yeah, that's usually an error that happens when there is no um, things. Because usually the only sample that ever has any problems that we've ever added a, deviant, a deviation from our, our sample analysis is, yeah, look at that. Yeah, so okay, we can troubleshoot this live. So as I mentioned with bad calibrations, 
Um, if we open up that log, uh, don't worry about this. This is stuff that, as part of Wonders, we do actually take care of for you. Um, it just got, oh, darn it, I'm on a Windows PC. Uh, okay, so uh, all I was doing is, so in order for things to calibrate well, you actually have to have a number of calibration points. Um, and this data that we actually selected as a demo data is the best. Um, it was just for demo purposes anyway. But what you can find is something like this peak here uh, that has, the, the, sorry, this, not peak, this uh, sample, which has no calibration peaks associated with it. So what Formularity basically did was it said, hey, there's no data associated with this, um, this sample. And uh, said, hey, yeah, I'm done. Since, I can't, since there's no data associated with the sample, I can't do anything, so I'm done. Um, so the correct thing to do uh, would be to uh, remove this sample and uh, analyze it, um, reanalyze it again. Now again, I'm gonna stress, this is atypical. Uh, we normally do take care of something like that. Um, so what sample was that? Oh my God, Windows. I'm using a Windows keyboard, uh, and but on a Mac. And so then when I switch back to Windows, I'm still in Mac mode and uh, it's all a mess. Um, so Columbia surface water, uh, six, six, two. And I'm just gonna move that because I don't want to actually delete it. But if we then rerun it, it should actually run through. But first, this is extra stuff, don't worry about it. Me just getting it back to the point where I can show. All right. So a good way you can tell if formularity went wrong or right is Formularity should take a second to run. Um, and by a second, I mean uh, quite a few seconds. Uh, if it finishes almost immediately, uh, that means it ran into an error. Um, and so the log will then contain information that allows you to troubleshoot that error. Stress, uh, if you are using Wonders data, we sh that those errors should be taken care of. Uh, if it's published Wonders data, those errors will have been taken care of. Um, these were data that we kind of threw together for this exact purpose today. Yeah, so that's the problem is that one of the samples was uh, um, not, <laughs> was not calibrating correctly. What I'd recommend doing, uh, just to make sure everything works correctly, is simply select the Altamaha River samples. Uh, so the six samples that uh, begin with Altamaha, and then drag and drop those onto the, um, box instead of using all of the data. That would be the simplest uh, approach rather than trying to troubleshoot it like I just did. Um, but know that the log does contain information uh, whether you can or cannot uh, troubleshoot it. Yeah, so I'm gonna guess um, when you only used one XML, as I said, formularity behaves differently whether you provide it one XML or not, um, or, or multiple. Uh, what I would take a guess at is that um, uh, since we have it set to align, formularity probably is like, hey, I can't align a single a single uh, XML file. <laughs> Don't know what you want me to do with this. Um, alignment only makes sense if you have multiple uh, data sets. Now again, so I do wanna add the stress. If you're having problems and you're only generating a .txt or a .log file, uh, try using a subset of the data, primarily the Altamaha data, and that will help you climb over that bump a little bit. Cool, so that means everything should be set. Now again, this is where things get a little weird. I can't guarantee that everything is correct, um, but that's, well, that's interesting. Hmm. How are folks getting two different results? That's curious. Um, let's see. 
So you might, Bob, you might think about um, showing your formularity window and making sure all the settings are correct for yeah. the folks getting into their stuff. Yeah, so here I have formularity open. Hopefully it's clear. Um, if the settings are a sconce from this, uh, it could throw problems. So one of the key things is do make sure the adduct is blank and that the result is M-P. Um, so that means mass minus a proton. Um, make sure that you have the calibration set to linear and that the start tolerance is 5. Not 0.5, but 5, and that the end tolerance is 0.5. Um, I'm trying to think of things that would be the most likely to cause like an, a no run error. Um, alignment, that wouldn't stop it from running. You would still get reports, but you would get single reports. Uh, formula tolerance wouldn't stop it from running. DB mass limit. Um, make sure the uh, uh, one interesting thing that I've noticed sometimes happens. Uh, make sure that the minimum relative abundance is zero and make sure the maximum relative abundance is one. I've noticed that sometimes this, on some folks, uh, when I've helping, been helping them out with formulary, that randomly doesn't always set to one and I don't really know why. So Bob, I'm wondering, um, seeing something in the Discord, the, the ionization must be proton detachment. Yes. Right? As yes. opposed to proton attachment. Yeah, so this has to be detachment. If it is attachment, you're not going to get nothing. It's going to fail um, because uh, the ionization is an instrumental component. So how we ionize our sample uh, goes on the instrument side. I'm not sure whether or not Will will address that um, uh, during the virtual tour, but that is something that Wonders tries to standardize to ensure that the data isn't hyper variable. <laughs> Is at least somewhat controlled, which is hard to do. I want to stress, it's hard to do with FTICR. So even with all of our strides, it's not a hundred percent successful, just decently successful. And that result field um, is determined based off your ionization selection. Yes, it's based on. It, yeah, so you can't change the result field. This will change based upon your ionization and what you have as your adduct. So for example, don't do what I'm about to do. <laughs> if I change the adduct to a uh, hydrogen, you can now see it's H plus, M plus H minus P. Um, so if that adduct is not blank, you will only have, um, you'll, you'll have whatever the adduct is. If it's chloride or whatever, um, it, it will change. There might be a cat in view. Seems like we're getting more successes now, as far as okay. I can tell in Discord. Cool. Sweet. So again, um, whenever you download something from Wonders, let's see if I can actually find a smaller data set that I can download. We do have instructions uh, that come with uh, each um, wonders, uh, that's fine. Yeah, the fact that your database isn't named exactly the same is perfectly fine. Uh, they are identical. Um, and sorry, but my cat is demanding attention. That's life. the smallest one, H.J. Andrews and Patrice Paul. So fortunately, I can actually show you what it looks like when you download something from ESS Dive. Um, so when you download it, oh my god, really? <laughs> when you download something from ESS Dive, simply just Unzip it, and you will have a uh, folder that looks like this. You can open up FTICR, and you'll see all the XML files that you can use. But more importantly, under the README, uh, you will see FTICR instructions that 
uh, tell you where to get all the files that you need to download, um, what you need, uh, exactly what all the settings need to be, as well as providing you with uh, an image of what the screen should look like. Uh, so if you ever forget anything or anything seems a little bit confusing, um, there is, uh, anytime you download something from Wonders, you um, can get all of this information. Uh, and then there is some other information that you can get in here as well. Um, so cool. Unfortunately, uh, I am going to move on. Um, so even though we aren't, uh, not everyone is at the current same stage. Uh, uh, we do need to, I want to get at least to how we actually use this data for something. <laughs> um, Bob, you might mention um, what they'll be doing in the hands-on, or at least the students will be doing in the hands-on piece this afternoon. Yeah, so student, the, the 28 uh, direct participants will be having a chance to actually align data uh, later. Um, they'll actually, I think, from my understanding, they're actually going to be downloading stuff from ESS Dive and actually aligning it themselves. Um, they will then be using a subset of that data uh, to analyze on Kbase. Um, so if you don't fully grasp it right now, you will have a chance later uh, in the day to start aligning the data uh, and we can work on those specific errors uh, there, here and there. Um, so as I said, unfortunately we do need to move on because we basically have a little under an hour uh, and I do want to make sure that we do cover some of the other uh, details. So when you do get a report, uh, whether or not you have it, fortunately, if folks do not have a report, if they didn't get a report from, formula, from formularity, under the um, Emsel Summer School 2020 in the repository, I did already generate the report for you. So you are able to participate in everything. You just can't, uh, so if you didn't have any success with the original report, we got a report here it's a variation of the port. There are some changes to it. Um, but you will still be able to use this as a means to uh, participate in the rest of the tutorial. Uh, sorry, my hand's back. So if you were to even open up that report currently, the one that is on GitHub, so even if you did not get a report from Formularity, you can still look at this report with, along with me. Um, you'll see that there are a couple uh, columns <laughs> that contain useful information. So the first column contains the mass or the M over Z values. Uh, the next several columns contain information regarding stoichiometry. So things like number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, et cetera, et cetera, as well as number of uh, identified isotopic peaks. Uh, beyond those stoichiometric uh, columns, there is one that constitutes the composition. So this will tell you whether or not the compound is CHO, CHON, so whether or not it is a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It just won't tell you the number. It won't tell you the actual formula, just what elements are present. Next is a class column. So this is similar to um, that discussion that was uh, earlier today about whether or not we can identify amino sugars, things like that. Uh, this is assigning classes based upon one of those uh, provided boundary sets. Um, but we will actually be assigning a couple other classes as well. Next, we have a neutral mass, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> That's uh, this scares me. Uh, this has to do with when it's not charged. Um, from there, we have an error column. This is the error associated with the assigned uh, formula. Uh, yes, so I thought I had that mentioned. Yeah, so there is, um, uh, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. Um, so we have an error column. This will mention the error uh, associated with the assigned formula and how much uh, how, how much it deviates from the identified experimental formula. Uh, given that we had it set to 0.5, this error should always be below 0.5 ppm. From there, we have a candidate column. This should list the number of different potential formulas that could match this mass. Uh, as you increase mass, this number increases exponentially, and there are ways to decide what is the representative formula. Um, 
not necessarily the best ways, but there are ways, uh, and formulary does that for you. Um, and then from there, after that first column, after that last column, uh, we have a whole bunch of samples that contain information about intensities, and that's about, again, more stress. Even though it does, it might be tempting to use those intensities, highly recommend always changing them to presence absence for our purposes. There are certainly experimental reasons where you might want to use those intensities, um, but this is not one of them. So cool. So next we're going to be moving on to actually walking through some common analysis pipelines, particularly the analysis pipeline that we use as part of Wonders. Um, and there was uh, the, so no, they will not all be zero. Uh, they will have numbers associated with them. Uh, if they are all zero, that probably means that the database wasn't loaded correctly uh, or CIA wasn't checked. Or as James says, you might have to scroll down. <laughs> um, where's my brain? Uh, yes, so this data is good. And you could use this report um, if you wanted to, but there are some things that should be removed. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we use a, I wrote a script called uh, FTMS R analysis, which is based off of an R package developed by folks at Emsl, awesome folks at Emsl. And in order to download, so at this point, um, we will need to set up, uh, a usable R environment for folks to use the scripts that I have uh, written, again, based off other packages, of course. Uh, in the FTICR tutorial uh, home repository, there is a uh, file, so you should have downloaded this file as well, um, called install packages commands.txt. If you open it, uh, it will have all the packages you need to run any of the scripts that I have. Um, you should, I've tested it, uh, but again, things break in unexpected ways. Uh, you should be able to copy and paste this directly into R or R Studio uh, and be able to um, start analyzing this, uh, these R scripts and stuff should be allowing you to participate directly within these R scripts. Um, regarding some questions, so yes, uh, as James says, there are gonna be a lot of zeros uh, in this data set. Uh, and that's because a lot, of, a lot of masses have no associated molecular formula with them. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. That could be that there's database limitations. We certainly don't know all of the different combinations of organic matter that exist. It could be that they do contain other elements that uh, we don't know. It could be that they do contain the elements that we know, uh, but they didn't fit our user-defined filter because of, again, when you go out beyond that very basic filter, and we actually have a very liberal filter in that regard, um, when you go beyond that filter, you might start getting incorrect formula assignments. Um, so like the, the false positive rate goes up um, significantly. And so there are a lot of reasons why a lot of molecular formula uh, aren't assigned. Um, and that's just one of the, uh, I don't want to say, um, downsides, but one of the limitations of FTICRMS. But that being said, um, even though you can't assign formulas to all of the masses, uh, you still get, you know, 3,000 molecular formulas in a sample. That's still pretty robust. Um, and more sometimes. Uh, so regarding the numbers in the sample columns, those are just the peak intensities. Those are the intensities associated with uh, the masses. Um, and so how intense in the spectra they were. Um, and as for our data, it is prudent to in R set those to one basically, if they have a number or set them to zero if it's zero, presence absence. So is anyone having any trouble with this install packages command? I did refine it from previous <laughs> installations of this. Uh, interesting. Cannot remove prior installation of Ipsys. 
I've certainly not run into that error before. Um, hmm. Waiting to hear feedback from others before I. Oh, that's also weird. So these. Uh, yes, install from sources. That's fine. Um, that is completely access acceptable. Um, failed to install. Interesting. So again, there is problems. Uh, what there might be variations in what R scripts folks are running. Uh, sorry, not R scripts. Uh, what versions of R uh, folks are running in R Studio and things like that can also impact it. Uh, cannot remove prior installation. One thing that might be causing that is either you don't have administrative privileges, don't know why that would be, um, or uh, you might have to close R to ensure that all your packages are unloaded and then restart R to ensure, yeah, as uh, Katie is uh, mentioning. Um, yeah, that's my guess is that it's probably loaded uh, and that might be causing errors. There's no package called process X. That's weird. I don't know. I've certainly, that sounds like a dependency that I certainly never installed myself. Um, I'm not sure. Again, that might be an R version uh, problem. Maybe there's newer R versions that already have that package included. Um, something like that. And my cat's leaving. Okay. I can move. Yeah. Kind of just, call, I'm kind of pausing. We do have time, fortunately. This, these steps don't take very long. Once the installation is done, this is the most time consuming step. Everything else should be really quick. Uh, do you want people to indicate whether they had success or not? In yes, the please. Yeah. Just so you can kind of get a, a pulse. Yes. I just need to know whether or not people uh, have success, even if it's a simple, yep. <laughs> cool. Awesome. I feel better because uh, I was very worried. Astounding silence is never a good, it, it could be either a good or bad sign. <laughs> um, sweet. So. Uh, hopefully, again, I know there might be some errors lingering, um, but moving beyond, uh, in order to run the script, the first script that we're going to be working on is if you just simply double click FTMS R analysis um, and open it up, you should get something that looks similar to this, um, where you have the required packages. Uh, you can change the sample name. You might want to change, well, actually, no, I changed that for you. So it should say K based tutorial. Uh, summary is equal to false, but it explains what that is. Okay, cool. That's good. Um, this uh, explains what it does. If you want to run that, you can, but for now, you don't need that. Um, beyond there, uh, if you press source from here uh, on the FTMSR analysis, regardless of your operating system, uh, huh, I definitely updated that. It, it's fine. It's the same script. You can change the sample name to tutorial only if that works. This is just what's going to be put on the output files. Um, so you can change that to whatever you want. Um, so if you click source uh, or do what is a command shift run, control shift, I'm sorry, command shift R, control shift enter, things like that, depending on your operating system, uh, you should see a window that pops up. It might appear behind a window or something, so kind of look for it if it seems like nothing's happening. But that pop-up should be asking, oh, okay. Uh, that pop-up should be asking uh, where you have the report. So in this case, the report that I'm referring to is that uh, kbase underscore report dot CSV. That is the report, okay. Tim sounds right. <laughs> I think you might be using an older uh, an older FTMSR analysis uh, script, uh, James. Yeah, because there are two FTMS. There's actually a couple. There's one in the home page 
And then there's one under the Emsil Summer School. Everything we're doing is under the Emsil Summer School except for the install command. And that's not the best organization on my part, but that's, <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you see that pop up, just select the location of the kbase underscore report.csv. Uh, this script will then just run and it should run fairly quickly. Uh, what it will do is it will go through that report, kind of partition the data out, as well as remove any of those peaks, any of those masses that were associated with an isotopic signature um, and any mass that exists below 200 m over z or above 900 m over z. The reason we remove isotopic signatures is that currently, under the current CIA formulation, uh, isotopic signatures, isotopic compounds compose some problems with the molecular formula assignment process, as well as analyzing downstream analyses. Um, and so it's just a good idea to just remove whether or not, remove them if they have an isotopic signature uh, to, to eliminate, and eliminate and control for any kinds of issues they might, they might cause. Uh, the filter, it's fairly arbitrary. Um, the 200 to 900 range is usually just the most, uh, I don't wanna say accurate, because that's not a fair statement for the FTICRMS, because it does go down to around 99, 97 M over Z. Um, but it's the most consistent, um, is what I'll say. From For at least Wonders data, it behaves very consistently behind there. We can get differences and similarities using this mass range. And so if folks have had a chance to run this, um, kind of give a shout out, uh, just so I can understand whether or not things are moving along or if they're completely stalled. So again, simply open it up. Click source or however you want to run your scripts in R if you have a different preference. Um, and it should come up with a window. Select where that window is, in that window select where the uh, report is found and you should, get, you should get two files output. And I will kind of explain what those files are in a moment. Because we have about a half hour. Which should be plenty of time. Because usually this half of the uh, tutorial was the entire tutorial. <laughs> and I usually had about 45 minutes uh, to an hour. So, I have 45 minutes to an hour, so. Hmm. Okay, that might be because you have multiple. It's probably because you are using your self-generated report, which is fair, it's fine, but the results might be a little, little, little wonky. Um, so, this, is an awesome R package that I rely on super heavily, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> this, all of my scripts, everything that I write is based off of the files generated by this R package. Um, now again, they're fairly modular, so I can adapt them for new reasons. Um, but this is a uh, package developed by Lisa Bramer et al. Uh, over in Emsil. And it is a, basically a package that helps us put FTI, FTI CR data into a I don't want to say standard, but it, it, it consistent format. It keeps things consistent, regular, um, and easy to manage. And importantly, the way it does this is by partitioning that report into two separate files. A data file, which contains your mass by site information. So you can think of this data file if anyone's ever worked with an OTU table before. Uh, this data file is kind of like your OTU table. It contains all of the different peaks that were identified. Well, and remember, these are still are not molecular formula. These are masses. Um, and then the different sites or time points or whatever samples that you have. The mole file contains all of the molecular information for those masses. So if molecular formula were able to be assigned, um, this mole file contains that information. In addition, FTMSR analysis does a lot of heavy lifting for us as well. Uh, it calculates things like NOSC. So in VGC's talk, you heard uh, her mention NOSC, as well as Gibbs Free Energy, that Delta, you know, Delta G Cox, calculates that as well. It calculates uh, aromaticity index, which is a measure of how aromatic compounds potentially are, double bond equivalence, so how much in saturation uh, or saturation there is, um, variations of those metrics. It also assigns boundary sets. So not only does it assign that standard boundary set that we've discussed before, uh, which are things like amino sugars, um, 
proteins, lignin, lipids, things like that, but it has two other boundary sets, one which is a modification of that first boundary set and an entirely brand new boundary set, which considers not only CH and, uh, sorry, um, HC and O to C ratios, but also things like N to C and N to P ratios to get a more complete picture of the molecular landscape. But these two files, for all the scripts that I write, and if you kind of hunker through my GitHub, anything that I have published on my GitHub uses these data and mole files. And they're useful in downstream analyses, such as identifying what types of carbon are present. How do these types of carbon change through space or time? Are profiles of these carbon different and distinct to each other? Um, so we're just gonna walk through two analyses, and there are so many more analyses that can be done, but just two. Uh, we're gonna be generating a couple of vane prevalent plots. So these are these plots that plot the O to C ratios against the HTC ratios to kind of get an understanding of the molecular landscape, I like to say. Um, and then we're also gonna compare molecular properties. So things like aromaticity or just mass across all of our samples and just get an understanding of what's there. These are not in-depth analyses. These are just kind of uh, seats uh, showing you how to work with this data. And there's a typo. Yeah, fixed. <laughs> um, this is just kind of hoping, uh, hoping to demonstrate how you can actually start working with this data and start answering questions that might be very interesting to you. Um, rather than guiding you down a particular analysis that we think you should do or something like that. So with those data and mole files in hand, if you ran FTMS uh, analysis.r, uh, you can now move on to the generate underscore vk underscore plot.r. From there, uh, all you have to do, open it up, click source, or however you want to run your script, um, another window will pop up, specify the location where you have your data and mole files, and you should see two different um, Van Crevelin plots generated in your data set. In fact, I will do it along with you to show. So here's the thing here. Click source. See a window pop up. So don't worry about that, another project. Um, uh, where did I put this? There we go, there we go. Okay, uh, oh, actually, <laughs> look at me cheating. I didn't run this yet. <laughs> cool, and that happens. All right, so it finished running and in your folder, you should now see two uh, files. One that's titled all data. And then in this case, since I picked sample number one, uh, you'll see something that should be titled unless you change the sample number, uh, something that's SW uh, East Fork, SW43. Uh, so just to show you, this is what our um, Van Crevelin diagram would look like for all of our data. This is what our Van Crevelin diagram would look like for a single sample. Um, and the colors indicate the different boundary sets that we uh, assigned based upon a one of the three boundary sets. Um, and you can see there's differences in between, you know, when we look at all of the data versus only one sample, some of these differences arise. Um, and to kind of give you some more detail, uh, a Van Crevelin diagram uh, so looking, this is actually uh, an all data collected from a different um, plot, but um, they're really useful, as I said, for understanding how one sample might change from another sample uh, in terms of its overall bulk molecular composition. So if you see a shift in the molecular formula from a very high O to C ratio in one sample to a very low O to C ratio in another sample, that might be something important worth noting. Um, Ostensibly, a Van Crevelin diagram is incredibly simple. All it is is it's plotting a, um, it's plotting uh, H to C, the, the atomic ratio of hydrogens to carbon, against the atomic ratio of oxygens to carbon. And then a lot of folks have empirically, with some success, identified boundaries which correspond to similar, rather I should say that correspond to overall groups 
of compounds. Um, now I want to mention these aren't hard and fast because uh, again, we're only dealing with molecular formula. We have no structure. We have nothing like that. More importantly, this isn't considering things like nitrogens, uh, sulfurs, uh, you know, phosphoruses. And so we often use the term, and it's, it's ac the most accurate we can be, is that anything within this green region here is simply a lignin-like sample. Um, and that's about all we can actually really say. Uh, we can't say that it is lignin and it goes this kind of lignin. We can't go that deep. Um, we don't have that capability with this current data set. There might be ways to really get dig down, but that's not what we're covering today. Um, as I said, there are other boundary sets and those different boundary sets and um, different coloring schemes might help you reveal different patterns. Um, so did people have some success in generating a VK uh, plot? Yes, no, maybe so. Sweet. Possible. As I'm making lots of noise. Uh, cool. Because what we can do now is I built into the script a way to kind of like tweak the VK plot. Um, so not only can you tweak the threshold of, so how often you have to see some data for it to actually be included in a, a Van Krebelen diagram, uh, but I've also, which might, I wouldn't tweak that one. Leave this at zero. <laughs> this was designed for a different data set. I don't know how this is going to behave with this data set. Um, but more importantly, the sample number uh, can, you can change. So particularly with this East Fork data, if you change that sample number to something like four, uh, you will get a different uh, plot generated. And I can actually show you this. Uh, I'll change it myself to four uh, and rerun it. So if you do get an error after rerunning it, uh, sometimes you do have to uh, clear your uh, environment. Um, it's a weird bug that I don't quite understand. It has to do with how um, the list files loads in data. Don't know why. But yeah, so you can see I created one from East Fork, and now there's a new one after setting this to four from Erpe, uh, which is a river. So East Fork is a creek in Tennessee, uh, and Erpe is a river in Berlin, Germany. Um, and you can see uh, there's some differences, but you can see that between these two samples in East Fork and then in Erpe, there are some variations in uh, uh, molecular landscape. Hmm. Uh, I know what that error is. Um, that sounds like you probably didn't get the, um, there might have been an error in uh, Annette, sorry to spe speak specifically. Uh, it sounds like that might have been an error in loading in or installing the uh, FTMS R analysis package. Uh, regarding what about cross-site VK comparisons? Uh, we do have the capability to do that. Yeah. Unfortunately, it does require a little bit of R scripting, but you can easily have one site colored one color and another site colored a different color. And that might give you a very direct shift in terms of um, molecular landscape. And it might be important uh, to see something like that. Uh, so certainly that is very viable. And importantly, one thing I didn't mention, this entire R package underlies a web app called Frida. Oh, yes. So there are going to be some differences there. Um, so be sure that you're always running the FTMS, R, the FTMS analysis R script that's in the Emsel Summer School. That's important. Um, so comparing the cross-site VK plots is something that this Frida uh, web app has direct capability in doing. Uh, and this is this does everything that the R script that I wrote does because this is based off of this is designed by the people who made the R package and uses the R package. <laughs> so it's a shiny app. Um, and so it's very easy to use. I'm not going to walk through it at this moment, um, but uh, you can upload the data and mole files that we've generated, or you can upload the reports yourself uh, to this file, and then it will walk you through how to do everything up to the point where you can visualize your own VK diagrams, your own, there are many other plots that are useful with FT, FTICRMS analysis, um, and it will walk you through each of that. So I do highly recommend folks to investigate that on their own time. 
um, as it is a very useful resource. So the next step that is pretty logical, because I do want to at least get to some of the other analyses that we can do, um, is uh, looking at uh, molecular properties. And so like my other scripts, I try to make these as um, you know, user-friendly as possible with varying degrees of success, of course. Um, if you simply open up generate mole plop, mole prop plop, uh, and then press source, like before, a window should pop up asking you where do you have your data mole files. Uh, I do recommend clearing your environment, and if people aren't entirely sure how to do that, if you open up RStudio, there's a nice little broom. Just click that, um, and it should go away. So if you open up the mole prop plot, which I currently have open here, um, and then just run it, a window will pop up. I'm already in the window that we need. It'll generate a couple plots and give you an error. Apparently, <laughs> melt changed since I wrote this script originally. It's not a problem right now. I'll update this on the package. We'll fix that. <laughs> um, but uh, right now, it should still work. So if we go to the folder, we now have two new plots, a mass distribution and molecular characteristics plot. Uh, so mass distribution looks something like that. Kind of busy. Oh, OK. Yeah, so I will fix that on my own time. Um, but something got updated somewhere. Didn't know. Uh, but, because um, I did actually just rebuild R recently. But, uh, so first, this is a very busy plot, but this is just a quick, quick glimpse at what you can have here. This is not what I would consider publication quality. Um, but what this is giving you a viewpoint is of the overall distribution of masses that are all in all of your samples. So this is not averaging, this is not looking at some kind of comprehensive metric. This is looking at all of the masses of all the molecular formula found in um, each of your samples. We have another graph that's generated, however, that actually does look at averages. So this is a bar plot that looks at the average amount of whatever the variable is <laughs> yeah, it's not. A, it's a bad idea sometimes to rebuild R. <laughs> um, uh, this will give you an average value for each of your samples. So what I mean by that is when we look at NOSC, this isn't giving a distribution of NOSC values in our sample, but rather the average NOSC value for a sample. So we can see, for example, that uh, this first sample, this Altamaha, uh, zero whatever, um, has on average a lower NOSC value than this. So no, this is just if out of all of the peaks that are present, that's sorry, out of all the molecular formula, in this case we actually do have, and all of the molecular formula that are present, um, That's weird. I don't know that error. Sorry, uh, they are. Um, brain skipped a beat when I saw that error. Uh, out of all the molecular peaks that are present, we're just averaging the NOSC values for molecular formula that are present. We're averaging all the NOSC values for all of those together. So if there's you know, several hundred, several thousand molecular formula present, and we just add up the NOSC values for each of those molecular formula, divide them by the total number of molecular formula um, to get the average. Um, there is utility in knowing the average NOSC value for samples, but there are also some, um, you know, considerations that do need to be made when doing something like this. Um, this doesn't, I don't want to word this, this isn't, that's why I generate both of these figures is basically what I'm trying to say is that we have, uh, it is prudent to understand how the distribution of these values change across the samples, uh, but sometimes for sake of correlations, sometimes the median is necessary or the mean is necessary uh, to get uh, a comprehensive understanding of these systems as they relate to each other. And I wanna stress, 
as we can see from something like these Jordan peaks here, um, these are going to have very, this, this NOSC value could be so low um, because there are so few molecular formula in the Jordan. Um, so that's something that you have to, you do have to be cognizant of. Um, but again, that's an experimental design question in my mind. Um, this is more just showing kind of potential avenues for analyzing data uh, rather than correct way. And the reason that I bring this up is that this property here, if you were to change this property uh, to something like ask and rerun this script, it might give me an error. Nope, oh, didn't give me an error. We now have a NOSC distribution plot. And you can see that even though the average is very different across the samples, the distributions actually aren't that variable in terms of NOSC. Now, what that means, that's really up to the researcher to come to some kind of conclusion for. Um, because it could mean anything. <laughs> um, but it is important to still realize that there is a difference between taking an average and representing that, using that as a representative versus understanding that there are still thousands of molecular formula in each of these samples and they should also be considered uh, independent, unique, things like that. Because again, we can change this to something like aromaticity. Seems to be a two is the limit. And then so I just generate another one for permitticity. And you can see again, distribution wise, there's variability, but average really would exa exacerbate that in some ways. And again, median might be more important than average anyway. Um, it, it's all about research questions. It's all about research questions. Um, so yeah, that is actually, I think, the last hands-on component that was necessary. Uh, I do want to go for some insight. Uh, so again, the script will generate those two plots depending on what you selected. Uh, here, the, def the default, yes, quotations are important. Um, here, the default is mass, but you can change that mass to anything you want. That is an acceptable parameter. I list the acceptable parameters there. Um, but just give some insight in case some folks don't remember. Um, NOSC is the nominal oxidation state of carbon. This can give you insight into some potential thermodynamic behavior of a system. Um, so what carbon might be more preferentially consumed or less preferentially consumed. Um, I personally like to use NOSC a little bit uh, because it doesn't have any standard, um, standard, uh, conditions associated with it. So something like delta, uh, the Gibbs free energy, it's not wrong to use by any stretch of the word, but it does assume certain standard conditions. Um, NOSC doesn't carry that assumption. And so if you're looking at a more anaerobic system, NOSC might be more appropriate. Might be. I want to stress experimental questions, man. As long as you have your question designed correctly, you're cool. Um, next, we have aromaticity index and modified aromaticity index, as well as double bond equivalents, uh, as well as its many variations. These simply just reveal patterns in molecular formula properties with, uh, ge while generating some inference uh, into the structure. Now again, I want to stress this is an inference. We don't know if we have a certain aromatic um, value. We don't know if it is actually aromatic. We're just inferring aromaticity based upon the number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and whatnot. Next, we have elemental ratios, which these are the most straightforward. These just give you insight into uh, how your data is changing relative to itself. Um, so the H to C's, O to C's, N to C's, things like that, uh, give you understanding of how much nitrogen relative to carbon do you have in your system. And then finally, um, all these metrics I want to stress are derived from the stoichiom uh, stoichiometry. And so they are uh, entirely dependent on your molecular formula assignment. Uh, if your molecular formula assignment isn't accurate, um, these metrics won't be accurate. So that is, this is just changing those things as I did. Feel free to play with that on your own leisure. Uh, we only have about seven minutes left, so I do want to finish. Um, there are a lot of other ways that we can look at 
FDICR data. Um, the first way is the way that I kind of um, am most familiar, most comfortable with because I am a microbial ecologist and I like to look at how information changes across large sets, large scales uh, or small scales, but still look at you know multivariate differences. Uh, and so one of the uh, common ways that we can look at this is using something like principal component analysis or principal coordinate analysis or an uh, NMDS. Uh, I do have example scripts for anyone, uh, I think under my metametabolome ecology uh, GitHub page. If you want to run these, you should be able to take those and kind of run um, with whatever data you have. Um, but here we're looking at a Jacquard based NMDS uh, from the seven rivers that you'll be working with this afternoon. And on top of this NMDS, I've actually fitted a number of the derived metrics. Um, and what you're able to see from this is that something like the Erpe River uh, seems to be very coordinated with the number of peaks that we have. Uh, and if you were actually count the number of peaks in the Erpe River, um, it is one of the more rich in carbon rivers that we have. Whereas something like the Columbia River in this orangey yellow color here uh, is more associated with a NOSC value. Uh, something about the NOSC is correlated to uh, the Columbia River. Um, we can see things that are like, for example, as James mentioned, um, so as James mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, something like the East Pop, the East Fork Poplar Creek, um, where the pore water and surface water samples are quite different from each other. Uh, whereas the pore water is actually quite similar to Altamaha in some regards, which is in blue. Uh, you can get a lot of information, just like in microbial ecology, you can get a lot of information from these multivariate analyses um, in FTICR. And this is me just plotting a molecular formula by site matrix. Um, I do want to add the caveat, as I've done like 800 times before, this data has to be presence absence. Uh, don't do this with uh, intensities because um, you will get potentially misleading results. And it's not accurate. <laughs> it's inaccurate to use intensities in this case. We can also do the transformation analysis as uh, VGC mentioned in her talk, uh, where we're able to measure the mass difference between two molecular formula, match that mass difference to some database of known and common biochemical transformations, and get some understanding of the potential biochemical activity within this site. Uh, we do have a script that will actually allow you to use this under the FTICR tutorial GitHub as well. Um, more importantly, one of the neat and kind of burgeoning areas that we're trying to investigate with this uh, is that not only do we get the mass difference between um, uh, uh, these different molecular formula, but we can also start building things called transformation networks, which gives us insight into um, the overall potential biochemical relationships of a lot of the uh, peaks that we have in our data set. And as James is highlighting in the Discord chat, uh, one of the neat things is that um, these transformation analysis don't require uh, uh, molecular formulas to be assigned. Uh, they can just be worked with, they can work with just the uh, masses. Uh, so no, no molecular formula are necessary. Um, and again, we are, while we aren't covering any of these in detail, I do have scripts in my GitHub that will allow you to take those data and mole files, and you should just be able to run them through without any kind of additional analysis. Um, and then these, but as I mentioned, these biochemical transformations are kind of neat uh, because they actually give us insight into the different um, biogeochemistry and systems. So for example, what we commonly see, as VGC alluded to in her talk, is that we seem to see a differential uh, proportion of nitrogen-based um, transformations in the pore water as associated with the surface water. We see that both in a uh, research site in Oregon that I'm working on, as well as some um, uh, a published data set that James Stegan worked on in, here in Washington. Um, extending these analyses to other ecosystems and uh, others and other uh, transformation types will hopefully begin to re uh, reveal some you know, generalizable principles. And then lastly, uh, just to touch on in super brief, something that Hyun Sung, Sung will be covering in like much better detail than I could ever possibly cover. Uh, we'll be working with 
um, we can use this FTMS, FTICRMS data to really apply it to biogeochemical modeling. Um, so we can uh, start getting a measure of, I'm using the term carbon use efficiency, but it's not the same CUE as others might be familiar with, but rather how much carbon is necessary, uh, how much of a given carbon molecular formula is necessary for some microbial organism to generate biomass or some organism to generate biomass. Um, this afternoon, you will actually be cal uh, calculating these using wonders based FTMS uh, data yourself. Um, so that's pretty sweet. And uh, with that, I do want to finish on time, um, leaving a little bit of time for questions. And again, I do realize there's some questions bouncing around Discord. Um, there are a lot of challenges to analyzing FTI CRMS data, like a lot. And I don't want to add, I don't want to give a disillusion that there aren't um, considerations that we, I glossed over. Uh, but what we've done as part of Wonders is we're really trying to limit the impact that those considerations have on the end user. We want to make sure folks can take our data, use it, and answer questions that are really exciting to them. Um, questions that we probably couldn't even thought of if we wanted to. Um, we do our best with monitoring levels of success uh, <laughs> to provide this data as quickly as possible. Um, both preliminary versions, as Amy mentioned yesterday, uh, as well, and then well curated versions um, as much as we can. Uh, all the scripts that you've played around with today uh, are going to be hosted as long as I can <laughs> on GitHub. Um, and I really do try to expand this page kind of regularly as long as I have as much you know time permitting. Um, but there are other, uh, as I mentioned, there are other scripts on this page th on that GitHub repository that you can use with the data that you generate today or data you generate on your own to really uh, dig down into things. Um, because FTMS data is really rich, contains a lot of information, and honestly, we're only really scratching the surface right now uh, with how we analyze that data. Um, and so with that, I really want to thank a lot of folks. Um, the Wonders team, uh, they're all awesome, super helpful. Uh, James and Emily for guidance, Emsel, everyone at Emsel for helping me understand this stuff as I came in with a, a okay understanding of microbial ecology and, and metagenomics and uh, had to pick up FTICR. Uh, and so I could not have gotten here if it wasn't for a lot of the folks at Emsel. Uh, and really um, awesome credit to uh, the folks who helped develop Frida and FTMS analysis uh, to really start uh, broadening the accessibility of FTICR data, because that's that's always been a challenge. Um, and of course, all the collaborators who are sweet and sent in uh, samples for wonders and continue to do so because this data set wouldn't exist if it wasn't for um, the awesome, you know, community science that wonders really helps promote. Um, and so with that, it's the end of the time. Um, but if anyone has questions, feel free to email me. Uh, my email may not be here. I can I'll put it in the Discord channel. Um, or just uh, whatever, contact me somehow. <laughs> uh, so yeah.